Well, uh, we're here to talk about health care, and um, I'm headed back to Washington, D.C. Uh, this evening. Uh, as you know, the uh, Veterans Week holiday uh, last week, I spent my time traveling around the district, and uh, this is really the first time I've been back in my district since the Affordable Care Act was rolled out on October 1st. Um, as you know, um, at the end of the fiscal uh, spending authority, September 30th, there was a great battle uh, among those of us who were trying to prevent uh, the complete rollout of this law because we know this law will be harmful to uh, not only those uh, who are trying to get health insurance in terms of their cost of premiums going up but also those who currently have health insurance uh, as it is uh, believed to be uh, eventually going to destroy the private health care market as we know. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let's begin with what we know about the rollout. Uh, the website is what's been getting all of the attention. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today has a lot to do more with uh, the actual underlying law. But the website, um, uh, we have spent so far today $634 million uh, on the infrastructure of the website. I'm sure a company like this here that uh, was hosting us uh, could probably do a better job of $634 million. But uh, in fact, you probably wouldn't know what to do with $634 million. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, why is this important? Because I serve on the Ways and Means Committee. The uh, head of the HHS, Kathleen Sebelius, has been before our committee over a dozen times in the last year. And every time she's been before our committee, we have asked her about uh, the progress of the website, the progress of the Affordable Care Act's implementation. And every time she's been before this committee, uh, she has said unequivoc unequivocally, uh, without hesitation, that they are ready for implementation on October 1st. There will be no hiccups. There will be no delay. She went so far as actually visit our offices, our individual congressional offices, and show us a beta type of the website that was very schnazzy and fancy and worked perfectly in my office. Uh, all the while knowing, we now know internally, the memos among uh, CMS and HHS was this website uh, had flaws and was not ready for prime time. So we've spent $634 million on, on, on healthcare.gov. CMS spent $394 million to build the Data Hub, which is the uh, network that's supposed to be holding all of the uh, uh, individual's health care records. They spent $292 million on the actual exchanges that are supposed to be up and operating, uh, where you go and shop for your health insurance. And then we spent another $31 million on call centers that are supposed to be signing people up uh, that, for whatever reason, can't get online. What do we know so far? Well, CMS. Don't take my word. We're not going to go into, into party politics here today. CMS themselves say today less than 20% of the people who attempted to log on to the website were able to do so successfully, less than 20%. CMS says today insurers have not been able to connect with the IT infrastructure for the exchange. CMS says that individuals are currently receiving incorrect pricing information on the site. CMS says that the federal exchange is sending multiple enrollments for the same person to different insurers. CMS says that the Federal Exchange is currently misclassifying spouses as children. And uh, to add insult to injury, the Associated Press uh, obtained a memo, internal memo from CMS, that said that healthcare.gov poses, quote, a potentially high security risk due to the lack of testing. In fact, we've learned that the website was granted a temp temporary security certificate so it could operate. In other words, the federal government gave its own, uh, its, its, its own entity, its own department, uh, a temporary security certific certificate that would not have been given to a private uh, business uh, even though the site was not ready for prime time. And the memo goes on further and says, the high risk of security will potentially threaten the sensitive personal information of millions of Americans at this time. So uh, clearly the website, the rollout, has been an unmitigated disaster, uh, and it's why so many of us uh, are shaking our heads as to why those in the Senate, and particularly the White House, uh, remain insistent that there be no changes, remain insistent uh, that we not make reforms, and that we not at least give individuals the same benefit that large corporations are getting in terms of not having to comply with the individual mandate for another year. Now, if, in case you think this is all just about a website and a temporary rollout, um, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. First of all, it's affecting jobs and it's affecting our economy. Um, the 
uh, Federal Reserve October Beige Book. This is one, something that the Federal Reserve, our federal agency, puts out. Uh, and they, employ, they, they uh, survey employers throughout their Federal Reserve uh, regional facilities to find out what's going on with employers throughout the country, what's affecting them, and so on. Their October Beige Book uh, cites layoffs and a reluctance to hire, uh, and the number one cause among the uh, employers surveyed, 70% uh, of them surveyed said that Obamacare was the major reason for their layoffs and reluctance to hire. <clears throat> now, we've all seen um, the president on television. We've all seen some of our representatives, the being senators on, on television, say that if you like your health care coverage, by God, you should be able to keep your health care coverage. Unfortunately, for many of the people behind me and for uh, most of the people in my district that have contacted my office, in fact, everybody that's contacted my office uh, in Peoria, Springfield, Jacksonville, and Washington, D.C., has called because their current health care plan that they have, that they've chosen, is no longer going to be offered. Now, the news media continues to refer to, and the, the, uh, uh, the Obama administration continues to refer to, as th th this grandfather clause in the law. And there's been an attempt to vilify insurance companies uh, as the real culprits to canceling these policies, that somehow they benefit by canceling these policies, and that it's really within their purview to be able to decide whether or not they want to continue to provide the current health care plans. I think it's important to point out specifically uh, what the grandfather clause requires of an insurance company. In order for an insurance company to be able to continue to provide a current health care plan, they cannot increase their premiums or co-pays by more than five dollars. Now, inflation in our country was four percent last year. So to tell a private sector business uh, that their co-pays and their rates cannot be increased by more than five dollars, uh, but they can go ahead and continue to provide the current plan if they'd like it, uh, is, a bit of a, is a bit of a red herring. And obviously, it's why nearly every person in America's current health care plan is changing because the Affordable Care Act uh, issues a, a Christmas list a mile long of requirements that they have to comply with that they're currently not complying with, and that makes health care more expensive for every health care plan. And as health care plans are more expensive, they have to raise their premiums and deductibles by more than $5. And so, bada bing, bada bam, uh, the current plans are null and void, uh, and people lose the health care coverage that they currently have. Why do we need to make changes? Well, <clears throat> the current uh, Obamacare rate models, uh, as bad as they are, are based on uh, an enrollment of 3.3 million people by the end of December. So for the Obama administration to continue to offer the rates that they have on their website, they need to have 3.3 million people uh, enrolled by December 31st. The Obama administration's memo says without 3.3 million enrollees by December 31st, uh, health insurance premiums will skyrocket. Their words. 3.3 million people by December 31st. Does anybody think they're going to sign up 3.3 million by December 31st? <clears throat> I'm willing to bet my, my Christmas present over. Of the 3.3 million, the Obama administration has to have 2.3 million of those 3.3 million as young and healthy enrollees. These are people that have to be under the age of 35 uh, in order for their actuarial calculations to work. Now, what is the problem with 2.3 million people that are young signing up? Well, there's a provision in the health care law called community rating. Community rating says that the least expensive plan, the least expensive premium, that being for a young person, can be no less than one-third the most expensive premium that that insurance company provides to the marketplace. Well, what that means is that a current young person who may be buying a health insurance for $1,000 a year or $2,000 a year is seeing their premiums rise into five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 a year for their premium because the most expensive health insurance premium within the health insurance market for that carrier has to be somebody perhaps with pre-existing conditions, has to be somebody who perhaps may be in their late 50s or early 60s, and clearly they are a more expensive patient, a more expensive insuree uh, than somebody who's in their 20s or 30s. Um, <clears throat> the cheapest health insurance premium 
for somebody who's 30 years old, male and single in America, under the exchange, is 260% more today than it was prior to the ACA. Say that one more time. According to the exchanges on the website, <coughs> the cheapest plan for a 30-year-old single male, which the reason we use him is because that's the cheapest insurer. 30-year-old single male is 260% more today than it was prior to the ACA. And so of the 30 million Americans who did not have health insurance prior to the Affordable Care Act, roughly half of that 30 million were people that were younger than me. And we all know why they didn't buy health insurance. It wasn't a priority. Uh, some would argue they can't afford it. But in many cases, quite frankly, they simply didn't think they would need it. And so to raise their premiums by 260% on the low side and then expect 2.3 million of them to sign up by December 31st um, is simply not going to happen. So what is happening? Well, uh, these new mandates are rolling on to insurance companies. Insurance companies are turning around and rolling those increased costs uh, to uh, their customers. And as a result, health care that was affordable is no longer affordable. And businesses are having to make tough decisions about whether or not they continue to provide health care coverage to their employees. Individuals are making tough decisions about whether or not they want to be responsible adults and continue to provide health care coverage for themselves or whether they want to throw up their hands and perhaps enroll in the state's Medicaid program here in Illinois, uh, or perhaps log on to the, the website if they can and apply for a subsidy uh, from the federal government to try and help lower their overall cost under the new exchange. These are simply not uh, realistic uh, solutions to a health care system that by and large had challenges but was not completely broken. Remember, we passed affordable health care, the Affordable Health Care Act, to make health care more affordable for 30 million people who didn't have health insurance. There are 300 million people who live in America. That means there's 270 million people who had health insurance. And according to the president, 80% of those people had health insurance that they liked and wanted to keep it. And so I think it's important that the president deliver on that promise. I think it's important that the Senate, at a minimum, uh, deliver on that promise. And this week, the House of Representatives is going to give them that opportunity to deliver on their promise. The House of Representatives on Friday is scheduled to vote on H.R. 3350, Keep Your Health Care Plan Act. What this law will simply do is basically say that current health care plans that are offered uh, and individuals who are buying them do not have to comply with the mandates of HHS or the ACA, the Affordable Health Care Act. And so this will allow individuals uh, in Quincy, throughout my district, and throughout the country to continue to buy the health care plan that they had had for years without increasing their deductible, uh, without changing the benefits that are currently under the plan, uh, and having to comply with the, the new list of uh, mandates in order for you to be deemed uh, adequate. I have 750,000 constituents in my district. Uh, every day we get between 200 and 500 emails alone to my office. In the one month since the Affordable Care Act has been implemented, we have yet to be contacted by a single member of my constituency whose rates have gone down uh, and whose plans have not been negatively affected by the Affordable Care Act. Now, the President said the average premium would be reduced by $2,500 a year if his law passed. I can assure you that if there were people whose premiums were dropping by $2,500 a year, they would be with, in the Rose Garden with the President. He would be highlighting those people. And so I would humbly submit that people are not being helped by this law. They're being hurt. And the Hippocratic Oath in Medicine is first do no harm. If a law that was passed that was meant to help people is not, if a law that was passed that was meant to lower premiums is not, and if a law that was passed was to cover people who didn't have health insurance, is not accomplishing its stated goal, then why are some in Congress so insistent that that law remain intact? Why are some in Congress so insistent that the people behind me and the people in my district pay a higher premium for a plan that they don't want, for services they don't need, and for something they can't afford? I mean, this is big government at its best. This is the nanny state that so many feared would come from a federal government who comes into your family's personal business and says, I'm sorry, the plan you've had for 20 years isn't good enough for you. The plan that your employer provided for you, the plan that your union negotiated for you, isn't good enough for you. 
Titan Wheel, Caterpillar, State Farm. There is not an employer-provided plan in my district that meets the minimum standards of the ACA. And so these businesses are going to have to take more money out of their profits, more money out of their potential payrolls, more money out of the investments that they would make in their businesses and in these communities uh, to pay a federal treasury uh, either in the form of a tax or in a higher premium at the exchanges uh, for plans that simply they don't need. So our hope is that H.R. 3350 passes in the House. My prediction is it will get an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote because I anticipate every Republican and probably a slew of Democrats will join us in the House. And I would encourage uh, those in the listening audience uh, to contact uh, their senators to urge them to do the same. And I might, uh, if I bear with me one minute, pull up a very interesting quote that I found this morning, actually. One moment. It'll be worth the wait. So, lest you think it was just Barack Obama that made these pledges, here is from the Senate floor, as they were debating health care, our senior senator from Illinois said this, Dick Durbin, and I quote, Many people say, I like my health insurance right now. I don't want to change. I don't want to go into Medicare or Medicaid. I like what I have. Would you please leave people alone? The answer is yes. In fact, we guarantee it. We are going to put in any legislation considered by the House and Senate the protection of you as an individual or employer to be able to keep the health insurance you have if that is what you want. What we are trying to create are voluntary choices and opportunities." End quote. I don't know how anybody who believes that statement, including the senator himself, could obstruct or vote against a measure that simply seeks to deliver on the promise that he made to his constituents uh, and the American public at large. 